to the power of computing. I compel you. <laughs> Pretty excited about your presentation. I, I think this is this is something that's kind of near and dear to my heart, I've tied to the presentation I gave at RSA about my mom breaking into a prison. And I, I really believe that a lot of social engineering attacks are extremely stale. They're doing the exact same thing again and again and again. So we were excited whenever we read your presentation right up. It sounded like it was going to bring in some really cool dynamic approaches to trying to handle social engineering. So with that, sir, please take it away. Well, first of all, nice to be here. So we want to talk about social engineering and using open source intelligence. Sounds complicated, but it's actually not. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Because when you look at attacks, phishing, social engineering, it's becoming so much more common. I mean, that's become an important part of us when we do a test of an organization. We're really pushing social engineering tests to test your employees to get them used to this. Who am I? I'm William. I am the founder, CEO, leader of CyberX. We are a cybersecurity firm in Charlotte, and we focus on helping small and mid-sized organizations. And that kind of got started for me. I'd been doing pen tests for some pretty large organizations. You see, you get into these organizations so easily, you break in. And then about the same time, a friend of mine had a small business, got compromised, and we saw the damage it did to them. And then we started sort of thinking, you know, we're working with large organizations. They're, they have tremendous budgets, tremendous teams, some of them, for security. And they have these mistakes that are costing them so dearly. What about the small and mid-sized market? These organizations don't have the budget. They don't have the manpower. And we started focus on helping those organizations build security programs within their budgets and within their manpower. First of all, what is social engineering? There's several definitions, but I, I like this one the best. It's any act that when you convince someone to take an action that might, might not be in their best interest. And the social engineering part is the convincing, right? I can convince someone to do something good that helps them, something bad that's not in their best interest, and they don't know it. Before I get too far into this, I want to tell a little story. Social engineering had not always been one of our specialties when we do tests. I'd say within the last years when we really started focusing and finding some patterns for creating social engineering that got us a huge success. I think over the last few tests we've done with social engineering testing of organizations, we have got like a 40 to 50% click rate. And we got credentials for these organizations every single test we've done, at least one user's credentials. So a recent test sort of exemplifies everything that we're going to talk about. So this was an organization. They, they handled back-end uh, payment processing for banks. Uh, they, and that was sort of like an MSP for banks, from what I could tell. They seem to have done a lot of things. It was sort of hard to figure out what all they did do. But they're dealing with top Fortune 10 companies, huge companies that they have contracts with. And they're doing this back-end processing. And they had several thousand employees, but only 50 were in scope for social engineering. Which was sort of a bummer, but we said, all right, fine. And we like to experiment when we're doing on these engagements, of course, in our labs too. And we had been testing out a new method for creating these phishing sites. So historically, you use something like um, HTT Track, SE Toolkit to clone the website, right? And we were playing around with some other methods. So we were testing using WordPress sites. We use a host, and we spin up the cPanel, and then we pre-built all of these websites the, that we use frequently. Um, so we'll buy it. We have a bunch of domains we own. So like, for example, there's a, this is not the domain we own, but say we own loginair.com. So then we can spin up a cPanel, and then the organization we're going to target, I can go, all right, Walmart loginair.com, and then I can create a phishing page for them. And I just create this site once, and then I just clone it into whatever URL I want. And I spin it up on a cPanel because I don't want it on the hosting that we use for our website, right, because I don't want to get blacklisted. Of course, I've checked with the organization. They're fine with us doing this. And this is the first test that we had done that we were actually using this method on a live test. And we accidentally clicked to set up an SPF record. So then later, we wanted to make these sites as legit as possible. So, of course, we set up DKIM, SPF, DMARC for our domains. We, we use Cloudflare. You guys probably are familiar with Cloudflare. We put the domain behind an SSL so the user goes to it. What have, what have we in the security told them? In the past, look for that 
uh, green shield up in the top, right? That's what we told them. So they, they know they're well trained. They look for that green shield. We've got it. So the SPF had been misconfigured. When we started our first phishing emails, uh, we were just using um, an O365 account that we use for this. They were all getting rejected. And we cannot figure out for anything why these emails are not getting through. This had always worked for us. And the security, the CISO, we'd been messaged with him trying to figure out. Initially, he said, yeah, getting past our security controls is not the issue. We want to test our users. We'll go ahead and whitelist your emails. Somehow, he had a change of heart mid-engagement. He said that if you're legit pen testers, you should be able to get your emails through. I said, all right. So now we have a challenge, right? We're going to get our emails through and show this guy that we're legit. So that we did. We ended up finding the SPF issue. And we did a ton of OSINT. We looked at Twitter accounts. We looked at the company website. We looked at their Facebook account of the company, who followed it. We looked at the employees. And then we started looking at their personal lives, where they were going, what kind of concerts had they been going to, and building out a, a dossier, I guess you could call it, of each employee who was in scope, the kind of things they like. And we want as much information as we can. I want to know what kind of food you like. What restaurants do you go to every other week? What kind of pets do you have? Do you have an affinity towards German Shepherds, for example? Of course, we'll talk more about each of these, but this is the kind of information we, we want about them. So for this particular social engineering, the spearfish we sent that um, got us in, we had found that the company had been endorsed by, I won't say what state they're in, but this, that state's banking board. They had been endorsed for their excellence, and they had posted this on their news on their website. So we took this information. We did a little research, some of the newspapers, big newspapers, that would have announcements about this kind of information. And then we sent them a fake email saying that we were with the Wall Street Journal, and we had seen the announcement, and we thought it was great, and we wanted to just put a little section in on the side column of the article. Um, we needed, wanted to know if they could answer a few questions. They said, sure. So during our research, we found the secure mail portal they were using, and we went to that page, and we saw what it looked like when you logged in. So we set up a fake portal just like theirs. Once we got permission from some of the higher-ups, the uh, more senior executives, vice presidents of the company, yes, we're interested in this, talk to this person and that person. Of course, this person and that person was not in our scope of the 15 scope. So then we sent them an email looking like we were the uh, CEO. And we sent this to a couple of the vice presidents, the vice president of compliance, the vice president of marketing, saying that we wanted, to be, wanted them to be featured in this article. Of course, they were excited. They clicked the link. They logged in. And there was a payloaded document. A uh, quick tip, use Dropbox for your payloaded documents. You can change that equals zero at the end of the URL to an equal one. It'll auto-download because Dropbox does not scan your files like Google Drive or some of the others does. Uh, of course, there's other ways, but that's what we were using then. And, but Dropbox was blocked at their firewall. Their company wasn't allowed to use Dropbox. So the employee decided, that, and this was the vice president of compliance, he decided to do it on his mobile phone. He logged into the portal. We got his credentials. Problem was he mistyped it on his phone. He gave us the wrong credentials. So then we had to respond back, great, we got your answers. Um, we added one more question. Do you mind filling that out? He logged back in with their correct credentials. So we've got the vice president of compliance. The vice president of marketing did it. And before we targeted her, uh, again, this is a quick tip. We looked her up on LinkedIn and YouTube. And we looked for all the videos. And we're looking for the kind of words this person uses, the phrases they use. And then we tailor our message to be just like them, right? Because people like things that like them. We like people who are like us. We like people who like the same things we like. So we went and we spent time looking at videos of this person, kind of words they use, the phrases they use, and then we worded our email to be just like it. So now we've got credentials. We've got to log in, and there's 2FA in place. So now the next challenge is how to get around two-factor authentication. So I didn't want to do anything this day, so we waited till the next day. Again, another phishing email to the vice president of compliance who we had gotten his credentials. I called up the company. I acted like I was somebody else. I was trying to get, get to his desk. It wasn't answering. Could they give me his mobile number? Got his mobile number. I'm, I'm just using spoof card. You, I don't know if you guys are familiar with spoof card. You can spoof your phone number to look like whatever number you want. We just used that. We got his mobile number. Then I spoofed my number to look like I was the ace, one of the security analysts 
at a different branch. When we're interacting like this, we try to get someone outside of the department this person interacts with. We try, if we can, to be at a different branch. Hopefully, this is not someone this person talks to all the time. They know what their voice is like. So we called them up. We said that we had been working on a back-end Active Directory 0365 sync upgrade, portal upgrade. It had gone south. Um, we were having issues. Users were getting locked out. Of course, we did a name drop. Uh, we just were able to stop so-and-so from getting locked out. I want to, it looks like yours is not locked out yet, but you're going to be locked out. We wanted to see if we could save you. Uh, we don't want you to lose time during the day. Again, so what we're doing, we're making ourselves look like we know what we're talking about. We know someone in the company, we're name dropping, and we're being helpful to him. So what does he have to lose? We're helping him, right? He says, sure, uh, what do you need? I said, we're going to send you an authentication code to get you logged back in. I just need you to read that to me, and then we'll put that in, and you should be good to go. The user was suspicious at first. They said they wanted to verify who we were. They asked for our last name, where we were, why we were using a different phone number. Of course, I had pre-thought about some of the questions he might ask. I had reasons. I'm on vacation. I tried to get a little sympathy out of this one. I said, I'm on vacation because of how bad this was. I'm actually, they've called me back, and I'm helping them do this. That satisfied them. They go on, proceed to say, yeah, they got me on social engineering last year, so I wanted to verify this year before I gave anything out but he was doing it again. And he gave us this 2FA code and we were into his account. And from there, we were able to send emails from his account and pivot into other accounts. A lot in that little story, and that, that's what we're gonna start talk, talking about now, is how we were able to find that information and how we built that. So why social engineering? We see the news and it's obvious that social engineering attacks are on the rise. It seems like every time we turn around, there's another incident, another huge data breach in social engineering is involved. Systems themselves are getting tougher to attack. Uh, they're still possible to attack, of course, but it's, it's not easy as say it was 15, 20 years ago. Not that I was testing them that long ago, but I do have friends. The humans are the weakest element, and it's easier to target humans. I've talked about this with a few people. There's different opinions around this. Everyone's entitled to his own, but I also think a sort of fundamental shift in how we design our organizations has added to the propensity of users to fall for phishing attacks. I mean, if you think about 15 years ago, maybe longer, a remote worker or an employee on, not on site needs to get access to a file. What do they have to do? They have to connect to a VPN. This might require a certificate of some sort. They have to connect to it. They have to authenticate. And then they can get to the file server, right? Um, be that the mail server, whatever it was. It was much more challenging. There was more t technological steps. Now, you want to get to the files, what do they do? Of course, this is not every organization, but a lot. You go to your O365 portal, you log in. You go to your Dropbox portal, you log in. You go to ShareFile, you log in. Users are much more used to just logging in. It's not as different as it was 15, 20 years ago. My sort of opinion is that this is adding, it's not the culprit, but our shift to the cloud is adding to users' likelihood to just log in somewhere. Another issue we have, I'm sure all of us feel overworked. We're all working over 40 hours a week, and because of this, we're in a rush. Many workers, they're in a rush. They're trying to get through their jobs. They have this to do, this to do. Someone comes in, they ask them to do something else that wasn't on their to-do list for the day. Now they don't know how they're gonna finish, and in 2017, it's, uh, an organization did some research, they did some surveys, and they found that 70% of workers in the United States felt overworked. Now, when you think about this, if I'm overworked, I'm trying to rush through my task, I take less time and I'm less cautious, right? I'm just trying to get things done. It happens to all of us. Even if we're trained, we get in a hurry, or I'm looking at something on my phone, I'm walking down the road looking at emails, and I'm trying to get stuff done, we're sitting on the bus, wherever we are, and that adds to why phishing attacks have become so much more successful. Uh, but another issue that I think is sort of a core issue is this, the innate human tendency to trust and to be helpful. We're trained from an early age to trust people. We trust authority, we trust our parents. I'm not saying this is wrong, uh, it's actually very right. We should trust and we wanna help people. We're taught to be kind, we're taught manners to be helpful even if that's the bad guys, even if that's the hacker targeting our organization, even if that's the attacker trying to get our 2FA code, we're trying to be helpful, right? 
I mean, if you think about what are we taught? Someone opens the door for you, you say thanks. Uh, this, that could get really psychological. Um, Nick Espinosa did a talk where he talked about cognitive trust, uh, where we develop biases. We do something so many times, it becomes normal to us, and we don't see what could be wrong with it. And that's another issue that is making social engineering more successful. As of June 2019, the best numbers I could get is there are 3 billion fake emails in a day. Pretty staggering number. And according to know before, um, some people disagree with this statistic. I cannot find where they got the numbers from. But it's interesting that they say presently only 3% of malware exploits strictly a technical flaw. And 97% targets users in some capacity. It asks them to do something. It might be skewed a little bit, but I think it's close to the correct number. Users, again, that they're the easiest way into a system. When we talk about layered security and Wherever you put them, some organizations say humans are first, some people say the human is just last, some people say the human shouldn't be a layer. Like it or not, humans are a layer in our security controls that we have to account for. So let's look at some of the social engineering that has caused data breaches. And these are just a few. You remember the John Podesta email, the DNC hack. How did that all start? That started with a phishing email. He got an email in his Gmail, someone has your password. There was allegedly a miscommunication or whoever was doing his emails, maybe I was an assistant, they forwarded it to the IT team, and the IT team said, this is Tev said, this is illegitimate. They actually said it's legitimate, and he had logged in. The attackers had his credentials. One thing, when we talk about this, one thing we note is have standard processes and procedures in place that can help with a lot of social engineering. Maybe not this one, but if you have standard procedures, all right, you believe you have a phishing email, this is the standard procedures to take. Uh, know before, say, has the fish alert. Uh, maybe that's how you do it. Maybe you forward the email to a certain person. But having those processes, standard process in place, can cut down on some of the users falling for them, or in this case, miscommunications. Then the Sony hack, that was 2014, where the allegedly North Korean hackers, there's some debate around who it was. Anyhow, whoever did it, the, the attack started off with spear phishing emails. They were able to gain access to the networks. They stole data, employee data, sensitive emails, employee salaries, all kinds of information they made public. And then they used a wiper malware and wiped a bunch of computers. But how did that all start? It started with spear phishing emails. Just recently, within the last few months, Greenville, uh, South Carolina, which is not very far from where I am, a cyber attack caused by an employee clicking a phishing email. Fortunately, Greenville was able to contain this very quickly. Um, because they had planned for this kind of attack. But again, this is another headline we're seeing with phishing being the cause of a breach. Within the last couple of months, um, there was the U.S. gas pipeline operator where operations were halted for a couple of days. And that, that ransomware attack, if you look at the articles, again, that one started with phishing emails. So we have to train our employees. And phishing is not something that we can ignore. We can't ignore the employee, the human factor of our security controls. So now we're going to sort of switch and we're going to start talking about performing these attacks. Whenever we perform a social engineering attack or engagement, test, whatever, there's a pretty standard life cycle that we follow. Of course, we start with information gathering. You're probably all familiar with the phases of penetration testing. We start with reconnaissance, right? I want to know as much information as I can about my target. If you look at intelligence, if you look at government intelligence, what are they doing most of the time? They're trying to find information about their targets. They want to know as much as they can about these people. I'm the same way. When we're on engagement, I want to know everything I can. I'm looking for your children. Why do I want to know who your children are? Well, it's not uncommon for people to use their children's name and a password. I want to know what teams you like. Are there local teams that you're following? Are there local teams you root for? Who do you like at the Super Bowl? What kind of foods do you like? the better of a picture I can build about each person. And this takes time. It's a, it's a tedious process. But the more I know about the individual, the more tailored my attack can be and the more likely I am to succeed. There's many ways to do this, but we typically use, drawn a blank, note-keeping tool for pen test. And we just create a tab inside of there for each individual. And as we go through, we create sub-tabs, Twitter, and we start in their Twitter URL. Um, who they're following, the kinds of tweets they like, the kinds of tweets that they respond to, as much information as we can about that. Then we go to LinkedIn, their profile, and we start building out the company. 
who's following the company. A lot of times employees follow their companies. We're looking for that. As much information as we can. Nothing is too trivial. Many times something doesn't seem like important a bit about this person, but we go ahead and add it. And then later when we're trying to attack this person, yeah, that piece of information comes up and it's useful. Then after we've done our information gathering, we move on to building a relationship with the individual. And depending on what kind of social engineering you're doing, be this physical, email, phishing, over the phone, if you're texting, build a relationship with the individual. And this could be physical. Maybe it's making eye contact, smiling at the person, saying hi, being friendly. If it's an email, if we're doing phishing, spear phishing, we typically try to never have our ask, the thing we want the individual to do, to be our first interaction with them. We try to have a conversation that leads into the action the best we can because they're more likely to do it without it standing out to them. If this is on the phone, I don't call them up and ask one single question. I ask a bunch of benign questions that are harmless, right? And then I throw in what I really want to know somewhere in there. And I don't have that be my last either because I don't want that to be the last thing they remember me as. So on an engagement, we did. We were targeting, targeting an individual. We wanted to know what kind of antivirus they had. So we called them up. Had a, we had a ruse, of course. We asked a bunch of questions. And, and then we were, trying to, we were allegedly troubleshooting some connection issues. And we had, in the course of the conversation, we had them right-click on their tray at the bottom tell us what kind of antivirus they had, the version it was, et cetera. And then we have that information. But like I said before, this is never the first question we ask. We always want the what we want them to do, be that click a link, open a malicious document. We want it to, one, be something that would be part of their job, something they would do on a daily basis, and this would not stand out in the least bit. And we don't want it to be the first or the last thing we ask because we want it to be just another part of the conversation that doesn't stand out. And this is what the attackers are doing too. The next phase is, of course, exploitation. That is, all right, in my previous example, that is the phone call where I ask and get that information from the individual. That might be the phishing conversation where we go back and forth and then I ask them to do something. And then we gather the information. And depending on what you're doing, so if this is part of a larger engagement, um, say a pen test, maybe you use this information for something else. And that's the execution phase. Many times, if we're on a, just a strict social engineering engagement, we don't move past the exploitation. But that's how the life cycle works. So let's talk about some of the tips on how to be successful at social engineering. Something that you have to understand is, and again, this could be a psychological thing. I'm not going to get into the psychology of it. I'm just talking from observation here. People respond one of two ways to something. They respond logically and they think about it, or they respond out of emotion. And if I can get a person to respond out of emotion, they're not going to take logical steps and they're going to do things that are flat stupid or flat detrimental for their organization. So creating emotion is a very powerful part of a social engineering engagement. Now, some of the emotions that I can create are fear. I send an email to your company email. You had jury duty. You didn't show up. You're going to be fined. And there's some kind of link to have them take some action. Person becomes afraid and they don't think, right? They proceed and they click the link. Excitement. If I can get the person happy, excited about something, a scenario we've used a couple times at different organizations um, because we felt like it was would fit. And this works good at the end of the year a lot of times. The scenario, we target, in one instance, we targeted the development team who developed some of this um, internal software that this company used. We pretended to be the CEO, and we talked about we had had such a good year. Uh, the company had such a good year. And we knew that the development team was integral to this success. They were a huge part of it, and we just wanted to reward them. So we were giving away some electronics. They could choose an iPhone or an Android phone. And we just needed them to log into a certain SharePoint folder and fill out a form, and then we would enter, draw, and some of them would win. They got excited. Authority. If I can pretend to be higher up, I'm going to do it. And a tip. In my social engineering engagements, we never try to be the person's boss because this person knows their boss, they talk to them, and more than likely they can just get up out of their chair and go ask them, hey, did you tell me to want me to do this? Or who knows, it might come up in the next morning's conversation. I'm sorry I didn't finish Project X because I was trying to work on projects Y that you told me to work on. And the boss is like, what? Project Y? I didn't tell you to do that. So we try to typically go at least one person over the boss's head 
someone that the person likely does not interact with all the time. And where are we getting this information from? Well, I can go to LinkedIn. Pretty much everyone's on LinkedIn. I can start looking at who's in what organizations, getting an idea of maybe who's who's boss. Sympathy, another emotion. So again, when I'm looking at doing my reconnaissance, my OSINT, I'm looking for what kind of things do you have an affinity towards? Do I see you tweeting a lot about supporting local animal shelters? Do I see you supporting animal rights, baby rights, who, whatever it is that I can draw sympathy from? Do I see that you just really like border collies and you've got four border collies and you're always tweeting or putting up Instagram pictures of your border collies? Well, maybe I call you up on the phone and I have a dog barking in the background and it's a border collie. And somewhere in the conversation, I throw that in that it's a, oh, I'm sorry, that's my border collie. He won't be quiet getting sympathy out of you, getting you to be sympathetic to a cause, that, that can be another great avenue to cause emotion to get the person to not think. Finally, another one that works very well, ego stroking. If I can create a scenario that makes you feel important, it's, it's possible and it's likely that I can trick you into doing what I want. And this works more for some people than others. Um, some people need their ego stroke more than others. But again, in, that, in the story I told, um, the one individual, after our engagement, the security team told us, you really picked the right person with that scenario because this individual, if you stroke their ego, they will do just about anything without thinking at all. It's another emotion that can help. So, um, like I talked about earlier, when we are working on social engineering engagement, the first step is to build rapport with the individual. Like I said, we never start off our email with click on this link to do X. We always want to build a relationship, no matter how short of a relationship this is. Any relationship works with the individual. This is a physical pen test, physical social engineering pen test. So maybe it's physical entry. I'm going to meet a person in the parking lot walking in, say hi to them, ask how their day is. Anything to build rapport with the individual. Um, start the conversation off with a joke, I'm sorry, whatever. And another very, very powerful thing to keep in mind is the principle of reciprocation. If you think about how we're taught from the time we're small, we're taught to reciprocate, right? Someone does something good for us, what do we do? We say thank you. It's manners. But people subconsciously have this tendency, you do something for me, I do something for you back. I mean, if you look at politics in many companies, people are doing something nice for one department because they want the favor returned, right? In my story I told, this was something we thought about, reciprocation. I'm doing this guy a favor. I'm going to help him, prevent him from being locked out of his account. So what does he want to do? He wants to return the favor and do something and be helpful to me, right? And that's how we got his MFA code and into his account. By the way, when we did get his MFA code, of course, we changed our own phone number on the MFA so that we had persistent access there thereafter. All right, so some tips for actually conducting the social engineering attack and using OSINT to do it. Whatever your interaction is, now, this is not a written in stone rule. I've seen some of the people at DEF CON, they can get tremendous amounts of information out of a single target. But we have found that it works well to only have one or two things my goal is to gather out of this interaction. But you start throwing in too many ask, too many questions, trying to get the person to do too many things. For one, you're going to fail. Social engineering is like marketing. When you have a call to action, you, have, well, you want one thing that you want this individual to do. Or if you do get them to succeed, the other risk you run is you're going to alarm them. And then another tip is think about who you're dealing with and what questions or objections are they going to have. And I typically run through the scenarios in my head, run through a few questions they might ask, and I think about some answers. Of course, you have to be fluid. You have to come up with things as you go. But if you have some, a scenario in your head before you start, it's easier to do so. So again, like the story I said, the scenario I had in my head was I'm on vacation, this has gone bad, and I'm being called in to help. So then when I'm on the phone with them and the person asks, where are you? So then I have a, a good explanation. I'm at a cabin in the mountains. I'm, I'm on vacation with my family. But because this happened, I've come in to help. So those are a few tips for the actual interaction. So now I want to talk about the tools that we use when we're performing open source intelligence. Of course, we start with search engines. And Google can give you a ton of information. If you're familiar with Google Dorks, a perfect way to get information about a target. We typically always start our OSINT recon phase with Google. If we're looking for emails, put in the domain. at So in this example, at whitehouse.gov. Put it in quotes. If you're familiar with the quotes operator, that tells it to strictly search for something. 
and you can typically find, depending on the size of your organization, some emails from them. So then there are pre-operators that you can put before whatever you're looking for. So you can search in text, and that searches in the text of web pages. You can search in title, in URL. There's a bunch of these that you can use. Um, there's a site, the Google Dork site, that you can go to, and they have thousands and thousands of these people are constantly adding to that you can go and check out. Then maybe I'm looking, I want to look at a certain website, and you put in the site operator first. So now I'm looking at on the whitehouse.gov website. I'm looking for, in the text, I'm looking for at whitehouse.gov. Typically, you'll find a couple pages where they have some kind of contact information, or maybe you start using the file type operator instead of in text, and you start looking in PDFs or in documents. We found sensitive information using this. Google Dorks are a great way to start. And then, so looking for subdomains of sites. So use the site operator, so sitecisco.com, and now the dash site is saying not the www site. So what you're going to get back is a list of subdomains for this organization. To get Sometimes to get subdomains, we'll look at crt.sh. It's a cert repository of certificates. I mean, you can start using the data from their public certificates to figure out what subdomains they're having or they're using. Or maybe at a, depending on the size of the organization, on their site, maybe I'm looking for PDFs with confidential in the title. And we have found confidential fi files publicly accessible on the internet using this method. So again, there's tons and tons of these Google dorks that you can use. I recommend you go check out the site. What we're looking for, of course, email addresses, sensitive confidential files, presentation files. A lot of companies present conferences. And we found organizations, sometimes they talk about the system they are using in their talks and how they are achieving a certain goal. Events, events they're going to, events they've recently gone to. This can be great information for social engineering. Maybe I send you an email, we forgot to have you sign X document at the event you just recently went to. I send them the document to sign and it's payloaded. Recognitions or awards that you got. Again, that can be used for ego stroking engagements. We look for children's names, pets' names, cats, dogs, what kind of pets they like. I mean, then their background, where they're born, high school, your engagement location, engagement photos, maiden name. A lot of this information can be found using social media. People are becoming more aware of the risk, and they are starting to lock their Facebook pages down that only uh, say their friends can share this. But a surprisingly number of times, you can still find this information on Facebook. Um, again, on search engines, the Wayback Machine. This becomes very useful when you look at a company's website, go back in time. How was it a year ago, five years ago? If we're looking at someone's Twitter page, maybe they've deleted a profile, they've deleted something, but sometimes you can find that on the Wayback Time Machine if you put in their URL. Google News, depending on the size of the organization, sometimes you can find news, recent events about the organization, and this can be very useful, useful to subconsciously make the target think that you're an insider. Um, maybe you know some, something that just happened. They're not thinking everybody knows this, but you throw that into a conversation and it subconsciously makes them think that you're an insider because you know X event just happened at this company. Email addresses. Like we talked about, you can just use the straight Google door. The Harvester is a tool that works well. LinkedIn, you can find sometimes companies' email addresses on LinkedIn. Some people flat out leave it public. Some of them you have to connect to. But if you are logged into LinkedIn, you can use this link here and you can put in what you think their email address is. Sometimes it'll correct it for you and it'll give you their actual email address. So that, like, that's something to try. But typically, if you find one email address, usually they use a format, be it first initial, dot last name, first name, dot last name. If you find one, a lot of times you can just guess what the others are. And then when we're looking for email addresses, we typically look at the, do an MX toolbox for an organization. I just picked a random organization that somewhere in my vicinity. Then we try to look at, all right, what kind of email security do they have in place? What email provider are they using? In this case, they're using Sophos email. Social media is a gold mine of information for open source intelligence. Instagram, people are constantly posting things on Instagram. So we're looking at what kind of things are you liking? What are, what are your comments? What are you commenting on? Who are you following? Who's following you? If we can find these types of workplace photos, this is a great resource for us. I'm going to try to, if I can, get the larger version of this image, start looking at the software they're using. And then when I create a social engineering spear phishing email, a phone call, I'm going to throw in some of this knowledge that I now have that, again, makes them subconsciously think I know what I'm talking about. Hey, this is John. I, I've got a quick question I have to ask. Is that a sticky note with a password on it? This one was not a password, but yes, we do look for that. Okay, 
Because I think you literally have 185 people trying to enhance this picture to see what the password is on that screen. So, and again, I just pulled this as an example. I have no idea who this people is, so it's useless. Yeah. For you. All right. Well, but that's, no. that's the way we're wired, right? That one is not a password. But sometimes you do find that. So again, on this one, on this Instagram, they, they're excited to be working at a company, and they posted a workstation picture. So what am I going to do? I'm going to look at their bottom bar. I'm just trying to figure out, okay, what OS are you using? What programs are you using? What programs do you have open? I can see, obviously, they like the San Francisco 49ers. And all of this information starts going into my dossier about this person to be used later. All right, so again, another workstation photo on Instagram. Um, I have no idea what they're talking about, but what can I infer from this? All right, first of all, I see that there's no printer of this, so they're probably using a central printer. So maybe my fish becomes an email from the printer with a scanned document. And then the person goes, what? I didn't scan a document. I open it and click it. I see they're using some kind of VoIP phone. So maybe it's an email of a voicemail. We have to train the individuals at our organizations to be aware of the information they're releasing. Again, badges. Never put your badges on. Tell your employees not to put their badges on. But if I'm on a physical engagement, this is useful information for me. Um, and then just a couple tools that can be useful, igstory.com. You can put in the person's handle, and you can pull all of their stories that they've posted. Or, again, search my bio, and you can put in that person, and you can start getting bits of information, pull it off of their profile. Next social media tool we always use is Twitter. If it's a company, I want to look at the company followers, because a lot of times the followers of the company might be employees. And I can start looking at the employees, what kind of things they are doing. Um, so on one engagement, we found a security analyst at this company. The week before our engagement, he had taken the OSCP exam with offensive security and failed, and he had posted on Twitter how disappointed he was. So our fish becomes, we realize you failed your test, but we just realized we gave several students during X dates the wrong environment. Um, we want to give you a free retake. We'll really apologize for what happened. Download this PDF, fill out the form so that we can get this set up for you. I'm just going to say right now, dude, that's evil. That is so, so evil. <laughs> well, it's what we're hired to do, right? Oh, true. Absolutely true. And, of course, he downloaded it and downloaded our malicious document. Um, then on Twitter, upcoming event. Again, that can be useful for phishing. If you're looking for an, a company, this is not as useful as it used to be because Twitter has changed what's public. So someone has to go turn on location data. But if you can get coordinates... You can do a Twitter search, and as you can see there, you can search within a radius of a location, and you can see everything posted on Twitter at that location. So if I have employees tweeting from work and they have their data public, I can start seeing who is at that facility of this headquarters building, say, and start figuring out from there who works at the company. You can, Of course, you can look for media. And a tool that works good for this is TweetBeaver. They have all kinds of things you can pull. You can download their friends, their followers, conversations they've had with individuals. If or not, they follow another person. Um, that's a useful tool. Of course, LinkedIn is a trove of data. You've got employee names. You have departments they're in. You can start looking at the employee responsibilities, what they're doing. Post in, I work at this company. I do this, this, and this. They sometimes talk about the tools they're using. Um, that can be useful information. Figure out who's who's boss sometimes based on chain of who's who, vice president, et cetera, et cetera, managers. Then communities and forums. Stack Overflow is a great place to find information. If the person is using a username with their username in it or their email address somewhere, you can start getting ideas of what kind of solutions and software they have in place. GitHub. We're always looking for hard-coded credentials. You can find information in GitHub sometimes, the code for websites, all kinds of stuff. Again, like we mentioned, the file types. Put it in that confidential, and this is a document we found um, on the open web. Videos. Before I target a company or an individual, I'm going to go look at some videos of them. What are the words they use, their phrases they use, how do they talk? And then we're going to mirror our attack to be similar to that. IP addresses, if you can find IP addresses, say you're using DNS, leaf DNS, looking up the company, maybe use MX records to find their IP addresses. Not always successful, sometimes it does work. All right, so let's talk about some of these social engineering attacks that we have done recently that have worked very well. Fake portals work tremendously well to get usernames and passwords. So this is one that we've seen a few times, and this works very good at the end of the year. So it's where the company had a good year. We're going to share some of the profit with our employees. We've deposited money into an account. We just need you to log in and go move that to your portal. And that, has, that works well at the end of the year. Again, if we're causing a motion, and that email takes them to this site. If you go to 401k.com, it redirects you to a site. 
Um, and this is the fake one that we built on this particular time. We're using WordPress. And as you see the login, that's actually a contact form. And contact form 7, a plugin for WordPress, has a nice feature that you can make a password field. And it'll actually dot, dot, dot it so it looks totally legit to them. They hit login, and it's actually a contact form that sends you an email if they use name and password. So this is the real site. I'm sorry. I got ahead of myself. Um, and this is a fake site we built. So as you can see, it's pretty well close. This is a fake O365 portal we built. Again, we have to train users just because it looks normal. If you're in a hurry, you still need to take the time. All right, go look at the URL. Is it the URL you go to? And what are some things that can stand out about this? First off, if you notice no account, create one. Those are not links. The real site, those should be links. A fake LinkedIn portal, a fake OWA portal. Some organizations customize their OWA portals. They put an image in the background. And if that's the case, we're going to make ours look just like the real one. Maybe we're trying to get them to install some kind of software and app. We've created some scenarios around that, and that can be very, very useful. Again, so like the organization I talked about, we now knew what kind of endpoint protection they had. So we could go create a payload that would not be caught by that antivirus. Malicious documents. Uh, this is the one I was talking about, the OSCP, that form that we had them fill out. And that was a payloaded form that connected back to our command and control server. We can attack an organization, and we can get in, but how do we change this? How do we help these organizations? And the first thing, we have to train our employees not to be afraid to challenge. They can't be afraid to say, say it's the boss, I don't trust this, I'm going to go verify. We have to change the mentality and tell them up front, build a culture of challenging. Train them not to be afraid, nothing bad's going to happen. Then, I, when we're training, go into an organization to actually train the employees, I like to have them do what I call an OSINT or an open source self-assessment. So I want the employees to go and start looking at their social media, look at their Facebook. What information can someone see about them? What do you tweet about? What do you post on Facebook? What kind of pictures do you post? Are your children there? Then start writing this down. We actually have the people write down the kinds of information that they post that's public. Maybe it's the news section of the website. Then when an attacker comes, they say, hey, public information, that can be used against me. And it helps them start separating. Just because someone knows some information, something that seems private, secret, whatever. It doesn't mean they are who they say they are. Never trust and always verify. This is something we have to teach employees. Always verify. If possible, let's do an out-of-band verification, I call it. So if they send me an email, I'm going to go to Google, find their website, get their phone number from there. I'm not, not going to use the phone number in the footer of the email address because how do I know that's real? If it's a phone call, they add, call, ask me to do something, I'll say, fine, I can do that in five minutes. And then I'm going to email them to verify. Always verify requests to do things, especially things that are not ordinary or different. And then the final tip we give to people is whatever you're being asked to do, if it causes any kind of emotion, any emotion, be that fear, excitement, anxiety, pressure, be that from authority, someone needs something quickly, compassion, pride, any kind of emotion, don't take action. Stop, go do something else for five minutes and then come back and read it again because it's likely not real because that's what attackers do is they want you to cause emotion. So that is how we can start to change this at our organizations. All right. Well, thank you so much, sir. Fantastic presentation. I do appreciate it. Would you say after you, you, you talked about kind of an evolution of your social engineering engagements, what would you say kind of the percentage of improvement you got with social engineering? Like you said, you started this journey a couple of years ago. Would you say you're far more successful now than you were before with some of the old and sale techniques? Oh, absolutely. The last few engagements we've done, when we look at start looking at individuals, and we tailor our attacks to that individual, and we build our attack into a conversation, we have success nearly 100% of the time. 